The Ancient City, Book 3, Chapter 14, The Municipal Spirit What we have already seen of ancient institutions, and above all of ancient beliefs, has enabled us to obtain an idea of the profound gulf which always separated two cities. However near they might be to each other, they always formed two completely separate societies. Between them, there was much more than the distance which separates two cities today, much more than the frontier which separates two states. Their gods were not the same, or their ceremonies, or their prayers. The worship of one city was forbidden to men of a neighboring city. The belief was that the gods of one city rejected the homage and prayers of anyone who was not their own citizen. These ancient beliefs, it is true, were modified and softened in the course of time. But they had been in their full vigor at the time when these societies were formed, and these societies always preserved the impression of them. Two facts we can easily understand. First, that this religion, peculiar to each city, must have established the city in a very strong and almost unchangeable manner. It is indeed marvelous how long this social organization lasted, in spite of all its faults and all its chances of ruin. Second, that the effect of this religion during long ages must have been to render it impossible to establish any other social form than the city. Every city, even by the requirements of its religion, was independent. It was necessary that each should have its particular code, since each had its own religion, and the law flowed from the religion. Each was required to have its sovereign tribunal, and there could be no judicial tribunal superior to that of the city. Each had its religious festivals and its calendar. The months and the year could not be the same in two cities, as the series of religious acts was different. Each had its own money, which at first was marked with its religious emblem. Each had its weights and measures. It was not admitted that there could be anything in common between two cities. The line of demarcation was so profound that one hardly imagined marriage possible between the inhabitants of two different cities. Such a union always appeared strange and was long considered illegal. The legislation of Rome and that of Athens were visibly averse to admitting it. Nearly everywhere, children born of such a marriage were confounded with bastards and deprived of the rights of citizens. To make a marriage legal between inhabitants of two cities, it was necessary that there should be between those cities a particular convention, jus cunubi, epigamia. Every city had about its territory a line of sacred bounds. This was the horizon of its national religion and of its gods. Beyond these bounds, other gods reigned, and another worship was practiced. The most salient characteristic of the history of Greece and of Italy before the Roman conquest is the excessive division of property and the spirit of isolation in each city. Greece never succeeded in forming a single state, nor did the Latin or the Etruscan cities, or the Samnite tribes, succeed in forming a compact body. The incurable division of the Greeks has been attributed to the nature of their country, and we are told that the mountains which intersect each other established natural lines of demarcation among men. But there were no mountains between Thebes and Plataea, between Argos and Sparta, between Sybaris and Cretona. There were none between the cities of Latium or between the twelve cities of Etruria. Doubtless physical nature has some influence upon the history of a people, but the beliefs of men have a much more powerful one. In ancient times, there was something more impassable than mountains between two neighboring cities. There were the series of sacred bounds, the difference of worship, and the hatred of the gods towards the foreigner. For this reason, the ancients were never able to establish or even to conceive of any other social organization than the city. Neither the Greeks, nor the Latins, nor even the Romans, for a very long time, ever had a thought that several cities might be united and live on an equal footing under the same government. There might indeed be an alliance, 
or a temporary association in view of some advantage to be gained or some danger to be repelled, but there was never a complete union, for religion made of every city a body which could never be joined to another. Isolation was the law of the city. With the beliefs and the religious usages which we have seen, how could several cities ever have become united in one state? Men did not understand human association, and it did not appear regular unless it was founded upon religion. The symbol of this association was a sacred repast partaken of in common. A few thousand citizens might indeed literally unite around the same Pritanium, recite the same prayer, and partake of the same sacred dishes. But how attempt with these usages to make a single state of entire Greece? How could men hold the public repasts and perform all the sacred ceremonies in which every citizen was bound to take a part? Where would they locate the Pritanium? How would they perform the annual lustration of the citizens? What would become of the inviolable limits which had from the beginning marked out the territory of the city, and which separated it forever from the rest of the earth's surface? What would become of all the local worships, the city divinities, and the heroes who inhabited every canton? Athens had within her limits the hero, Oedipus, the enemy of Thebes. How unite Athens and Thebes in the same worship under the same government? When these superstitions became weakened, and this did not happen till a late period in common minds, it was too late to establish a new form of state. The division had become consecrated by custom, by interest, by inveterate hatreds, and by the memory of past struggles. Men could no longer return to the past. Every city held fast to its autonomy. This was the name they gave to an assemblage which comprised their worship, their laws, their government, and their entire religious and political independence. It was easier for a city to subject another than to annex it. Victory might make slaves of all the inhabitants of a conquered city, but they could not be made citizens of the victorious city. To join two cities in a single state, to unite the conquered population with the victors and associate them under the same government, is what was never seen among the ancients, with one exception of which we shall speak presently. If Sparta conquered Messenia, it was not to make of the Spartans and Messenians a single people. The Spartans expelled the whole race of the vanquished and took their lands. Athens proceeded in this same manner with Salamis, Aegina, and Milos. The thought of removing the conquered to the city of the victors could not enter the mind of anyone. The city possessed gods, hymns, festivals, and laws, which were its precious patrimony, and it took good care not to share these with the vanquished. It had not even the right to do this. Could Athens admit that a citizen of Aegina might enter into the temple of Athena Polias, that he might offer his worship to Theseus, that he might take part in the sacred repasts, that as a pritane he might keep up the public fire? Religion forbade it. The conquered population of the island of Aegina could not therefore form a single state with the population of Athens. Not having the same gods, the Aeginetans and the Athenians could not have the same laws or the same magistrates. But might not Athens at any rate leave the conquered city intact, send magistrates within its walls to govern it? It was absolutely contrary to the principles of the ancients to place any man over a city who was not a citizen of it. Indeed, the magistrate was a religious chief, and his principal function was to sacrifice in the name of the city. The foreigner, who had not the right to offer the sacrifice, could not therefore be a magistrate. Having no religious function, he had not in the eyes of men any regular authority. Sparta attempted to place its harmosts in the cities, but these men were not magistrates. They did not act as judges or appear in the assemblies. Having no regular relation with the people of the cities, they could not maintain themselves there for any great length of time. Every conqueror, consequently, had only the alternative of destroying a subdued city and occupying its territory, or of leaving it entirely independent. There was no middle course. Either the city ceased to exist, or it was a sovereign state. So long as it retained its worship, it retained its government. It lost 
the one only by losing the other, and then it existed no longer. This absolute independence of the ancient city could only cease when the belief on which it was founded had completely disappeared. After these ideas had been transformed and several revolutions had passed over these antique societies, then men might come to have an idea of, and to establish, a larger state, governed by other rules. But for this, it was necessary that men should discover other principles and other social bonds than those of the ancient ages.